Okay, I'll introduce you right after Liz Theo Harris. And if Liz uh, Theo Harris is not here, then we'll go right to you in the beginning. Okay. Well, yep, we told I, her, we told her um, 4.05, so we should be good still. Yeah. Uh, so just let me know when you want me to begin. Yeah, are they, people still coming in? We'll give them another couple of minutes. Let, yeah. let me say, I'm Rod Platt. I'm going to be muted and no video because I'm dealing with um, allergy symptoms. I can't talk very easily. Well, we don't want to give you an allergy from all these people on the screen. So, so I will be listening with great interest, but I'm, you won't hear from me. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, I guess I guess you could start, Susan. Yes. I, hi, everybody. I Welcome. I, I'm Susan Mursky from Massachusetts Peace Action Nuclear Disarmament Working Group. And welcome to today's important program on warheads to windmills. Thank you, nuclearban.us, for organizing this program and to the many wonderful organizations who've co-sponsored. Welcome. I, Warheads to windmills says it all. You know, we've talked about climate change catastrophe and the ultimate dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. We see the inextricable link between them, the twin existential threats. They can seem overwhelming and insurmountable, but we're here today on this beautiful day here in Massachusetts I, to address those issues and to see how we can go forward together for our future. We have many wonderful presenters today from numerous organizations coming together. We won't give long bios, but you can see them on the Nuclear Band website and the Mass Peace Action website. Also the list of co-sponsors. Uh, I'd just like to go over what we're gonna do today. We have some great presenters first, and then we'll go have a round table with people talking about uh, these issues and uh, then a, a smaller web uh, round table talking about some of the uh, breakouts and then we'll go into breakouts. But after the breakouts, please stay tuned for the grand finale, which is a conclusion by Vicki Elson, sort of bringing it all together. Uh, it's likely we may go a little bit over 5.30, but um, please stay for the whole thing if possible. So first uh, is uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris here? No, she hasn't made it yet. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we start first with um, Ellen Thomas, who will introduce Congressman Eleanor Holmes Norton's bill. Ellen. Please unmute Ellen. I apologize. Um, yes, hi, and it's beautiful here in Western North Carolina as well, and thank goodness. Um, I am very, very pleased to tell you that Eleanor Holmes Norton has reintroduced her Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Conversion Act uh, for the 16th time she has introduced it. And um, I'd like to just go right into what she has to say and then talk a little bit afterwards. So Cole, would you bring it up? Sure, we'll do. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today on the crucial issue of nuclear disarmament. In 1993, District of Columbia peace activists were successful 
in getting a ballot initiative in D.C. passed that called for nuclear disarmament. Every Congress since then, I have introduced a bill based on that initiative, including the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Conversion Act of 2023, which I introduced last month. The bill would require the United States to redirect resources that are being used for nuclear weapon programs to use in addressing the climate crisis and human infrastructure needs, such as housing, health care, and restoring the environment. Beginning on the date that the president certifies to Congress that all countries possessing nuclear weapons have begun the verifiable and irreversible elimination of such weapons under the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine and threats of nuclear ab action, abolition of nuclear weapons is more important than ever. As the only nation that has used nuclear weapons in war and that still possesses one of the largest nuclear weapon arsenals, it is time for the United States to reestablish its moral leadership in the world by leading the effort to eliminate nuclear weapons. According to the Congressional Budget Office, <coughs> programs will cost the United States $634 billion over the next 10 years. That money could be better spent on combating the climate crisis and addressing domestic needs. Thank you for having me speak today and for your work on nuclear disarmament. Okay, that's uh, HR 2775 is the bill number. And this year, this session, it was introduced by more than just Ms. Norton, who is the only one who introduced it for the past 15 sessions. This time it's um, Representative Jim McGovern and Raul Grijalva, Rashida Tlaib, Mark Pocan, um, Ilhan Omar, all signed, um, introduced it along with her, which is great. And we need to get a lot more um, representatives to sign on. Now, Ms. Norton mentioned that the bill was introduced after a successful voter initiative brought in Washington, D.C., and I was part of the team that did that. And I would like to say today, since what we're trying to do here is to figure out ways that we can actually get to the point where the president signs the TPNW and the countries um, all agree that they're going to abolish their nuclear weapons. We have to get Congress involved in it in a much more active way. We don't have any senators who have signed on yet and have uh, introduced it yet. And it, you know, it's nice that it keeps getting introduced, but it really isn't going anywhere. It's never gotten out of the armed services or foreign affairs committees. So I would like to suggest um, we, we circulated a petition in Washington, D.C., outside the White House, day and night from 1986 to 1992. And finally, in 92, we took it to the voters. And we found that a voter initiative was an extremely effective way not only to educate people, but to motivate people. And, and once we won the election, um, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who had been um, against it before the election, decided to sign on because her constituents wanted it. So I would urge that anybody that lives in a, uh, an area where you have voter initiatives that you consider um, putting a voter initiative on the ballot, maybe even this election year, asking for your representative to uh, co-sponsor and your senators to introduce into the Senate this bill to actively promote it. Ellen, 
Thank you Thanks so up. much. Yep. Oh, yes, yes. But thank you so much. Uh, let's go on to um, Tim and Wallace from nuclearband.us. Okay, thank you. And we just got uh, Liz Theo Harris, so maybe we should jump to her okay. first. Okay, yes. Um, yes. Can we do that, uh, Nicole? Uh, yep, just a moment. I'll get her up. Well, I'll just say that uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is <laughs> from the Poor People's Campaign and the Kairos Center. And we welcome her here today to, to really pull this all together and, and hear her thoughts. You're on, Liz, but you'll have to unmute yourself. All right, thank you for letting me unmute. It's so great to be with everybody um, and uh, really appreciate this opportunity to be with folks and, and the occasion to make these connections, right, between militarism and ecological devastation, uh, systemic racism and poverty and a culture and a society that is just sick with violence, sick with war, sick with climate disaster, and uh, approaching, as Dr. King talked about, a spiritual death. And so what we know in times like these, when a nation as rich as the United States uh, spends you know, more than half of our discretionary money on war, um, when a nation as rich as ours since, 2011, since September 11, 2001, has spent $21 trillion on militarization of our communities and of our world. Um, when, before the pandemic even hit, we know this rich nation had, uh, you know, 250,000 people dying a year from poverty, had 140 million people poor and low income, with poverty being the fourth largest cause of death. We know we must take action together. We must organize together and we must shift the power structures to say yes to a peace economy, yes to climate resilience, yes to investing in, in programs of social uplift and no to war, no to climate disaster, no to racism, no to guns and military in our communities. And so I'm here representing the Cairo Center for Religious Rights and Social Justice as co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national uh, call for moral revival, organizing across this country, poor and low income people saying uh, together with clergy, together with activists, together with advocates, that we must build a movement that is powerful enough, strong enough and smart enough to, to really put people first um, and people over profits and over military and over climate disaster. And so we know we can do it. Uh, this is what has, it's, it's needed in, in the world history is when people who are impacted are in the forefront of movements for change. And so, you know, yes to peace, no to war. Um, let's lift from the bottom so everybody can rise. And thank you for, for pulling this together and for keeping our eyes on the prize, on peace, on justice, on, uh, you know, a just climate policy on programs that abolish systemic racism and abolish poverty. Um, so forward together and not one step back. Liz, thank you so much for your perspective and for uh, the positive, we can go forward and we can do this if we all act together. Thank you so much. Timon, Timon Wallace, nuclearband.us. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, um, Reverend Theo Harris, and thanks to um, uh, Congresswoman Norton about, for her bill. I'm here to uh, present our new report, which is out today, um, Warheads to Windmills, which is a, is a backup to the Norton bill, but is also a whole, a whole campaign that we're, that we're hoping we can, we can get going. And so I'm gonna share my screen and tell you a little bit about that very briefly. So hopefully you can see um, 
the report. Um, it's still, um, it's just a summary of our full report, which will be out later in June, but you can download it now for free um, and read it, and you can order copies of it um, in print. And uh, what we're trying to say in this report, um, for those of you who um, saw our, our previous one from 2019, we've, up, we've updated all the figures and we've updated a lot of the information. And we're really talking about um, these two existential threats and how they're linked. And we don't like killing birds. And so we talk about feeding two birds with one scone. No, why won't it? Uh, there we go. Uh, so there's our feeding two birds with one scone, um, because we we strongly believe that um, if we if we worked on the nuclear weapons issue, which is relatively easy compared to the climate um, change, um, we could we could release so many resources and um, put those to use to address climate. And the biggest challenge uh, that we face is that. Uh, the, the countries that are emitting the largest amounts of greenhouse gases, and as you see up here, the four countries, uh, China, US, India, and Russia, plus the EU, um, uh, between them, these countries emit more than half of all the global carbon emissions in the entire world. And these are the same countries that are um, pointing nuclear weapons at each other. So unless we can address the fact that we have to work together to solve climate, um, we're we're not going to get there. And we can do everything that we possibly can in the United States to address climate. And if other countries aren't doing the same, it, we're all going to suffer the same. So our our big important message, which we'll hear more about during today's webinar, is about the the global cooperation needed to address the climate crisis. But there's also money needed for addressing climate. And um, these figures, I won't go through them here, but they're in the report. And the full report will have all the references and details. You can see in this, um, this is basically the, the cost of nuclear weapons over the next 10 years that's projected. And we're talking about uh, officially six and a half billion. And if you add all these other costs that are directly related to nuclear weapons, it goes to over a trillion. And that money could be being spent instead on addressing climate. Now, we're not saying that the money can't come from other places. Of course, if the government wanted to save our future, they would put the money into climate. But this money is sitting there assigned to nuclear weapons, and it could be going into these things. And as you see at the very top there, the green, the Global Green Climate Fund, that alone needs 50 times what President Biden just promised um, a few days ago to contribute. We, you know, we've, we've got to help poorer countries to address their climate and as well. And there's jobs and brain power going into nuclear weapons. We have a whole, a whole research project on the STEM students and where they're going, you know, engineers and scientists, they're all being sucked into industries, making weapons and including nuclear weapons. And these people could be instead uh, researching, building, designing, helping to figure out all the kinds of problems that we're, that we're still facing to address the climate crisis. Now, we know we're not, we don't have this uh, happening right now. And if you follow the money, you can easily see why both the fossil fuel companies and the nuclear weapons companies are pouring millions into maintaining the system. And in return, they get sometimes a thousand percent return on investment because they get they put millions into uh, lobbying Congress and funding re-election campaigns, and in return they get billions of dollars of contracts with the government, or in the case of fossil fuel companies, all kinds of you know um, uh, permissions to 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 drill in the in the Arctic and so on. So we're looking at how do we put pressure on these companies as well as on politicians. And this is um, showing the 60 or so cities that have so far divested from fossil fuels, or at least started the process of the commitment to divest from fossil fuels, and a smaller number that are doing the same thing to divest from nuclear weapons, including, you can see the, the sort of orange dots, including North, New York City has done both. 
So uh, building a campaign about warheads to windmills is about seeing if we can combine our efforts and get things moving that, that divest from both. And you'll hear more about that from other people in the workshop. So here's New York City um, voting in the city council um, to divest from nuclear weapons. At the state's level, we've got campaigns in various states that are working on uh, fossil fuel divestment in Maine and New York. They've passed um, legislation, I think, in California. They've um, led the way in terms of a plan for getting rid of fossil fuels. But there's so much more to be done, especially on the nuclear front. This is um, in Massachusetts, where we have a bill to set up a commission to at least look at what Massachusetts can do about both these issues, because they're they're not doing enough. And there's Ellen Norton at the minute. level. Yep, I'm almost there. So this is about an international campaign and being in, in solidarity with countries all over the world that are working on these two global threats and what to do about them. This is the, these are the countries that have signed, ratified, or adopted the Nuclear Ban Treaty. And these are the countries that have active campaigns working, uh, as you can see, all over the world working to support this effort. Same with uh, the Fossil Fuel Treaty, which you'll hear about if you join the, the workshop later on the Fossil Fuel Treaty. There are very few countries committed to that yet. But again, 2,000 partners in 170 countries working to build a movement. So our, our message is, it's great to have you know, peace and love and harmony. We know that we, we all want a world that we can that we can have for our children, our grandchildren and our future. But we need a do the dove with teeth that's going to actually make this happen. And that's through divestment, boycotts, stigmatizing the companies, pressuring the politicians to actually do what they say they will do. Thanks. Thank you so much, Devin. Warheads to windmills. And now we'll hear from Medea Benjamin from Code Pink. And uh, I'll, you know, I'll give you a one minute warning at, at four minutes, Medea. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Uh, it is so critical that we look at the two areas of Russia and China and see how the war and hostility uh, is affecting our ability to deal with the climate uh, and uh, dangerously increasing the possibility of nuclear war. In the case of Russia and the conflict in Ukraine, while our media and many politicians tell us that victory for Ukraine is in sight, the Pentagon paper leaks show us that there is a stalemate. And the longer this war goes on, the more possibility there is for it turning into a nuclear confrontation, especially if the US gets involved with Ukraine in trying to take back Crimea. Generals have told us that Russia is not going to just leave Crimea uh, the home of many ethnic Russians, the home of a very important uh, naval base, and the uh, uh, an area that has been part of Russia for 200 years. Uh, so if indeed the, uh, the conflict starts to move into Crimea, uh, the possibility of nuclear war increases. When we talk about how we're going to uh, get more people involved in this issue, uh, about trying to stop nuclear war, uh, I think it's very important when we talk about uh, Ukraine to bring in all the environmental uh, devastation that is going on there, uh, the devastation in Ukraine itself, the devastation that comes with so much uh, militarism, increased use of, and production of weapons, uh, the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline that led to the largest methane gas emission, uh, the possibility of the blowing up of nuclear plants, uh, the increased use of fossil fuels to substitute for the sanctions against Russian energy and all the money that's going into this war. So I think it's especially important when we talk to young people, we bring up the environmental uh, impact and, of course, the possibility of nuclear winter and what that means for the planet. Uh, we do. We have been putting out a petition uh, aimed at environmentalists to get the leaders on board, and I must say it has been very difficult to get them to sign, just as ironically or in some crazy uh, uh, world we live in now, 
it, it's been hard to get leaders uh, against nuclear weapons, uh, with the exception of those on this call, um, to sign a petition uh, saying that the threat of nuclear war in Ukraine is so great that we must call for peace talks. Um, so between the environmental leaders, other leaders in the anti-nuke world, and uh, our representative in Congress, we have a lot to do. When it comes to China, it is also horrifying the increase in provocations, uh, the increase in the possibility of a confrontation with uh, Taiwan that could lead to a nuclear war. Uh, we know with the US modernization of its nuclear weapons, China is increasing its nuclear weapons from 400 to uh, predicted 1500 by 2035. U.S. Pre military presence increasing all around China, the Philippines, Australia, Japan, a new base in Guam. Uh, and um, instead, uh, what we have is the absolute need for cooperation between the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases, China and the U.S. Uh, China, for example, having over a thousand coal-fired power plants. Uh, but when Nancy Pelosi went to uh, Taiwan, China saw it as such a provocation that she stopped the cooperation with the U.S. on the climate issues. So what we need instead of all of this uh, provocation and war are peace talks in Ukraine and cooperation with China. And lastly, I want to say that China, not only can we cooperate with China on the environmental issues, China, we can cooperate to end the war in Ukraine. They have put forward a peace proposal that is very exciting. Uh, some of us just went to the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C. on Friday to thank them for that effort. Uh, and we, as the people of this country, uh, must work with China and every other government that has come forward, as well as the UN Secretary General and the Pope, uh, to say no to nuclear weapons, no to war, and yes to cooperation between the major powers. Thank you. Medea, yay, thank you. And now on to Natalie. Is Natalie here? Yep, I'm here. Natalie, hi. Natalie Mahane is from okay. Greenpeace. Sorry, me vain. Me vain. Mm. Please. Continue. No, sorry, continue on. I was just saying the last name was me vain. Go ahead. You can go, go continue on the intro. Bain. Oh, yes. Okay, great. So nice to meet everyone. Uh, Natalie Mebain from Greenpeace USA. I'm the climate director. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, you know, Greenpeace's history, it started because of nuclear weapons testing. Um, that's why Greenpeace exists. Uh, the United States, you know, throughout the 60s and 70s, and not just the US, but other countries as well, were doing um, massive nuclear weapons testing all over. Um, and in the 1960s, especially in early 1970s, the United States government was doing testing off the coast of Alaska um, and the chain of the Aleutian Islands, um, Chitka Island. And so this was going on for a long time. Um, and a group of folks uh, from Canada got together and decided that they wanted to essentially blockade the nuclear tests. They wanted to stop it from happening, the next one that was going to be scheduled. And they were able to get a boat together, the Phyllis McCormick, which was the first Greenpeace boat that they chartered. And they sailed out to try to get in between um, the Navy, who was going to set off the test, and the island. They actually got intercepted by the Navy, uh, but they kept trying many times. And so in the end, that's how Greenpeace came together, um, was a set of folks who were against nuclear war, nuclear prol proliferation and overall working for a more peaceful world. Um, that's where you know the whole idea of peace came from, is that it was an anti-nuclear organization. And so for this day now, you know, now that we're dealing with the climate crisis, and now that we're dealing with everything that's happening in our world in terms of its destruction, we have to really focus our efforts into what is our, you know, our biggest threats to this world. And as you know, previous speakers have said, the war in Ukraine has escalated the production of fossil fuels globally. Um, the United States companies, different gas companies, have now made it a point to increase their liquefied natural gas, their LNG production significantly. And right now in the Gulf Coast right now, there are 20 proposed or expanded new LNG plants that are being, uh, that are working, that companies are working to build right now. 
And this is increasing, obviously, emissions, obviously increasing pollution directly for the communities that are impacted first and worst from the pollution. And it's absolutely just mind boggling, considering that we know all the science necessary in order to slow down climate change. And we're doing the exact opposite. They're not just expanding LNG infrastructure in the U.S. Uh, right now, companies are trying to build five LNG export terminals in Mexico. And these are all this is all from U.S. gas as well as, you know, it's overall U.S. companies. And so there's been this mad dash rush to build as many fossil fuels as possible, even though we all know what we're in, the situation we're in with, with climate change. And in terms of, you know, working together in terms of the environmental movement and the anti-war movements and anti-nuclear weapons movements, you know, as somebody said earlier, the amount of money that we're spending as a nation and as a world on nuclear weapons is just ridiculous. It's not just spending it on the yearly Pentagon budget, which is now is well over $800 billion a year. But the fact that we're still spending billions and over a trillion globally for the production and maintenance of nuclear weapons, whereas if we even use a single one, it causes, you know, it causes, it causes a nuclear war, which destroys the entire world. And so there's really no purpose for them to exist, except for obviously countries trying to maintain their power and their authorities uh, with the threat of war. But threatening complete destruction is, is insanity. It's absolute insanity. And that's how our world and our government has been operating for a long time. And we're ignoring the climate crisis at our own peril. And so for us, you know, I believe that it's most important that all of these different movements come together in terms of saying we are fighting for the survival of our species and every species on earth, not just humans. And that whether it's climate change or nuclear war, neither one of those is compatible with us continuing as a species. And so I'm really happy to you know, be here and also to really build that together in order to, for all of us together in terms of building a movement where we can make ourselves safer and not just because of the environmental destruction, but also safer from uh, different world leaders having a bad day and deciding that they want to kill everyone on earth. And nobody, no one power, no one person, no one country should ever have that kind of power to be able to decide to end life on earth because they feel like it. And that is unfortunately where we're at um, with, the com with the countries right now that have nuclear weapons, anybody can decide. And the president being able to make an order that their generals have to follow and the order could be destroy the entire world. So I just was, you know, come on to the next person, next section, but I was really happy to be here and chat with all of you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, wonderful words, bringing things, bringing these issues together. Thank you so much. And now we're going to go on to our first round table, and I'm going to turn it over to Ivana Hughes, who's the president of Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and Susan Faberge, Climate Action Now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and I think Susan is joining us. I'm really thrilled to be doing this with her um, and just uh, absolutely delighted to be on this call with so many uh, giants, really, of, of both nuclear disarmament and climate activism. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to actually have three panels uh, beginning, our first panel will be with Kevin Martin from Peace Action and David Swanson from World Beyond War and Jill Stein uh, from the Green Party. And again, um, we don't need introductions uh, in this audience or really in any audience, but uh, so, so thrilled to be with all of you. I think we need Jill for this first um, spotlight and Jackie will come later. Yes, perfect. Um, so um, just given everything we've heard about, um, really the interconnectedness of these issues, I just wanted to invite um, uh, Kevin and David and Jill to, uh, for each of you to just give us a little bit of a sense for how you are thinking about the connection between the two issues. And also perhaps even more importantly, how you think that the what are often seen as two separate communities 
uh, might be coming together uh, uh, to, to really address uh, both of these existential threats uh, to all of humanity. So uh, let's start with uh, Kevin, and then we'll go to David. And two minutes for each of you, I apologize. I know that's not a lot of time, but we want to have a little bit of a discussion as well. Um, so Kevin, go ahead. Thank you, and thanks to everybody for being here on a Sunday. So the thing that I have been thinking about is not just analytically or solutions driven or constituency driven or organizing, how do we knit together peace and disarmament with uh, climate catastrophe and, and from an organizing perspective, I think that's all very important and that's hard work. And those of us that are organizers will do that. And I think we have the analytical tools, et cetera. What I think is important now is a larger social transformation around security, because it's been just an article of faith, and we've been fed this by the government and the mass media that's spending more on the military, having new nuclear weapons, going to war, occupying, et cetera, and that there are all these external threats to our national security. China, of course, is the big one now that's being promoted. And not that China doesn't have a lot of problems of its own, it certainly does. But if you ask most people in our failing society, frankly, because that's what it is, what are the biggest threats to security? They're not going to say that nuclear weapons are going to make us safer. They're not going to say that F-35s are going to make us safer. People are concerned about the cost of housing. Young people are especially concerned about the economy and what kind of jobs are they going to have. Gun violence. Uh, even the Pentagon itself knows that uh, that climate crisis is a challenge to our security, and the climate crisis is driving conflict and war around the world. So I think we do need to think as organizers about how do we knit movements together, but we also have to think about how do we connect with ordinary people's concerns about their security in their neighborhoods, in their communities, et cetera. And I think most people wouldn't even think about, let's we need new nuclear weapons, or we need uh, whatever it is in terms of foreign bases, et cetera. They, they think that there are other real threats to their security in a crumbling, failing, eight, you know, end stage capitalist society. We've got a lot of more immediate problems that people need to have addressed. And I think we can show them that we can take the resources from the war machine and towards uh, addressing climate change, et cetera, to all the other ills that are really plaguing our society at this point. So I think delinking or breaking the link between militarism and security is one of the most important things we can do, not just between movements, but, but more societally. Wonderful, thank you, Kevin. Uh, David. Yeah, I think we are much stronger together if we always work to unite in efforts against nuclear weapons and nuclear energy and other environmental destruction and against nuclear war and all other war. Uh, I think that war is the top impediment to the cooperation that is absolutely essential <laughs> and urgently needed on climate and the environment. I think war is where there are dollars that could go to good use. Uh, and of course, war is the intentional and massive destruction of the earth and the water and the climate. For an environmental organization to make an exception for bombing and poisoning and rendering radioactive the environment is just insanity. Uh, I think uh, that, of course, war can destroy the earth even faster than any other form of environmental destruction and, and increasingly threatens to. And this is a U.S. creation. Of 230 other countries, the United States spends more than 227 of them put together, uh, exports more weaponry than 228 of them put together. Uh, the U.S. could end war. Uh, we got my city to divest from fossil fuels and weapons together and educated people about the fact that it's one issue. I recommend doing that. Um, didn't know how many seconds I was going to get. Let me close with a poem that's about haiku length that I thought might be all I would get. And this is with apologies to Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in war. Some say in rising heat. From what I've seen, I do implore avoidance of the choice of war. But if we can achieve that feat, I think I know enough of greed to say that for destruction, heat will fill the need and life delete. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Jill, uh, it, it's such an honor to be here with you. 
uh, please. Likewise, and big thank you to all the organizers um, and all the speakers. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Kevin and David just said. And, you know, I'll just add as someone who's been struggling around nuclear weapons, I'd say since the 1970s, it was really the first issue that I mobilized around in medical school because many of my uh, mentors and teachers were actually very involved in the nuclear disarmament movement at that time. So I've sort of, you know, as, as someone who's been very interested in how do we educate the public about this issue, especially, it's been very interesting to watch it kind of wax and wane over the years. And coming away from that, I would just say it's it's so important, you know, summarizing the sum total of what I've learned here is that it's really important that people feel, number one, like this is an immediate and personal threat to us, which it absolutely is right now. And I I'm, you know, really underscoring everything that Medea uh, just said moments ago about the immediate nuclear threats that are really exploding before our very eyes right now around, you know, Russia and all things Ukraine and also China. These risks are incredible and people really do not understand that nuclear war is not something that you can say happens over there uh, because of nuclear winter, which, which few people understand and few people understand how low that threshold is at which nuclear winter gets triggered and at which food production absolutely plummets. So people do not understand that nuclear winter really is a global threat. Um, so, you know, this really creates you know, uh, in, in crisis, there is opportunity, like the uh, Chinese saying goes. And there's an incredible opportunity here because the uh, moment is so really terrifying if you understand what's going on. And what's, you know, exciting about uh, what's being put on the table today, the warheads um, to windmills, is that this frames it all in, in one frame, because it's hard to explain each of these things, the severity of the crisis, the very personal threats to our own survival right here and now in both of these crises and the solutions for them. So, you know, I think this is a great beginning. And I agree, if we're going to fund these solutions, we need more, um, more resources than what will be freed up by eliminating nuclear weapons, although that's a very important beginning. But we do need you know, in my, in my view, we're going to ultimately need a bigger uh, set of resources, and we really need to look at militarization, not just denuclearization, but really revising our foreign policy to put real security uh, at its core and uh, to prioritize diplomacy, uh, international law, and human rights rather than uh, brute force. We really need a world in which... Uh, uh, we are governed by the law of nations, not the law of the jungle, which is where we're going right now. And, and final note is just that, you know, what these two um, issues also have in common is that there are very extremely, incredibly powerful interests that are staying the course economically and politically. We have both a military industrial complex and a fossil fuel industrial complex. And the more we can unify in pushing back against that, the better. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for those sobering remarks. Um, I'm going to uh, hand it off to Susan, but before I do, I just want to underscore one point you made about nuclear winter. According to a study that came out last August, just mm -hmm. uh, nuclear war between India and Pakistan would result in over 2 billion deaths from starvation alone. This is not from the actual deaths in attacks and radiation. And um, if the US and Russia each used one third of their current arsenals, it would be closer to five and a half billion deaths from starvation worldwide. So this is clearly an issue. And that's the end of human civilization as we know it, as many have, have already said. But let me let me hand it off to Susan now for some discussion. Thank you so much, all of you. That was, this has all just been extraordinary. I really appreciate the conversation. So here's what we're going to do for the next few minutes. Um, we're going to address this question, which is the connections between nuclear disarmament and addressing the climate catastrophe, how those two um, very powerful movements can better link together, work more closely together so that we are um, addressing both of those existential risks to humanity and all of life. That's the question on the table. And after a very quick summary, we're going to invite our panelists to 
go into more depth, talk with each other. Uh, we facilitators may jump in, but I'm very eager to hear what you all have to say. And essentially, what I what I heard people say is that there is this very clear link between the threat of nuclear disaster and the threat of a climate catastrophe. And that what, what would be a really powerful reframing of it is people are terrified about basic security right now in this country. And as someone said earlier, capitalism has reached the stage where it's just one climate, um, it's, it's just one kind of um, crisis out of control crisis after another and people are scared. And so if we could really come together and talk about a solution, and that was a real theme and what everybody said is, how can we address security in this moment? How do we find the resources to protect against climate change? What do we do um, about our fears, very genuine fears about war? And this idea as Jill framed it as this is a moment when um, things are so clear in a crisis, the contradictions, they are so painful, people are feeling it. And if we can find a way to bring these two movements together, um, then we have an opportunity to talk to completely reframe security. And so that, that, that's a very, powerful, um, a very powerful comment. And just to deepen that theme, Actually, if we could, you know, going very concretely into the resources that we could devote to the transformation we need for climate change by, by taking that money, the jobs, the incredible jobs. And if you read Tim's latest piece, um, wow, if you look at the connections between the wars, between those, between building nuclear, uh, you know, submarines and building wind, you know, wind, offshore wind. So this is a very, this is actually a very fraught moment and really exciting moment. And that's what I heard from people. Let's, 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 let's take, let's frame the narrative for people. And now we would love to hear from the four of you, a little crosstalk, who would like to begin. Just a few minutes, but we'd love to hear you question each other, say what another person got you thinking about Yes, please, Jill. Uh, I'll just throw in a real quick thought that those who don't understand security are mainly our power holders and our corporate media. If you look at polls that ask people, you know, what are their leading concerns and fears? It's always uh, the economy, jobs, healthcare, um, you know, debt. Those are housing, you know, losing the roof over your head. How are you going to pay for food? You know, and this is all of what's being cut now in order to maintain our obscene uh, military budget. So, you know, in my mind, the question is not so much how do we reframe it because people kind of get it, but how do we lift up the, you know, the wisdom and kind of the men momentum that's already there for the right thing? And how do we challenge power with that in such a way that we can actually move some solutions forward? And, you know, the more that you know, the more we can build solidarity, whether it's out in the street, whether it's, you know, pushing bills. But, you know, in, in my experience, uh, power doesn't reform itself. You know, in the words of Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And I want to just also quote Alice Walker, um, more or less paraphrase her, saying that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. So it's really important for us, you know, to work with those uh, groups like Dr. Theo Harris was speaking for, who, you know, who are really supercharged and ready to go. The more we can do that, the better. Yes, uh, Kevin. There's a misunderstanding, and it's not all that surprising, of the elite, particularly in Washington, of the United States being a declining power. Now, declining powers are very dangerous. And there are historians that will tell you that a declining global power, such as the United States, is almost inevitably going to be in conflict with a rising global power, which is China. And people in China would say they're not a rising power. China has been the richest society on earth for something like 14 of the last 18 centuries, and they will be again this century. But 
the, there's a problem with the elite in Washington sort of not really understanding this dynamic. And so what do they do? They, they cash in what they think their most important ships are, which is militarism, more war, more money for the Pentagon. I mean, look at what happened you know, with the pandemic. That could have been a fantastic opportunity to reorient our resources towards global health. But no, instead, the Pentagon budget went up. Now, the reason that, that there's an opportunity for us to exploit is the, what I would call the diplomacy deficit, that the United States, even though Biden himself knows more about the war machine, treaties, nuclear weapons, diplomacy, et cetera, than probably any president we ever had, and he has a lot of great veteran diplomats, for the most part, they're not doing squat. The countries that are actually leading in diplomacy right now are China, which brokered the rapprochement between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the United States was pissed. They sent Burns, William Burns, the director of the CIA, to uh, Saudi Arabia to complain about Saudi Arabia making peace or making nice with uh, Syria and Iran. Now, the winners in this hopefully will be the people of Yemen, that that horrible uh, humanitarian catastrophe where 400,000 people have died for what I couldn't really tell you. And many of us have worked for years to end the war in Yemen. Uh, and that was because of, and knock on wood, we don't know for sure that peace is guaranteed at this point, but a pretty amazing thing happened, which is that Saudi Arabia, just as horrible as Saudi Arabia is, just decided the war wasn't worth it anymore. And we helped to sort of convince them that, even though we didn't have the administration on our side, we got Saudi Arabia to do something that our government was against. So it shows the power of persistence in terms of people's movements. Even within the peace movement, I don't think a lot of people have been working on Yemen or know the success story. So it's been a relatively small handful of groups, many of you on the call, that have helped to do that. And it does show the power of diplomacy. And that can be applied towards better relations with China, towards ending the war in Ukraine, towards all kinds of things. The problem is the United States right now is very much out of step and there's a real uh, deficit of diplomacy. And again, it's not that surprising, given that we're a declining power. But we, as people that do believe in peace and diplomacy, can raise up that contradiction. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, that was great. And this is such a uh, rich area to unpack. And we do need to move on. I'm really sorry, David, that we can't hear you right now. But I want to thank everybody. And the big point is the climate movement, the uh, movement to end nuclear weapons. We need we need to work together. We need to build a mass movement. We need to turn it around. People are on our side. Let's see, let's see a government that reflects that. Thank you all so much. This was really, really rich. I took lots of notes too. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. And we'll have our next uh, set of panelists. Okay, so welcome to our new set of panelists. And um, this is gonna be a shift from the last uh, session. What we are asking each of the people that are up on your screen right now, we're inviting each of you to talk about how your organization addresses one or both of these issues, nuclear war and the climate catastrophe, and really especially moments, ideas, threads that can help um, us to build collaboration, because ultimately that is the outcome we're looking for today. So um, each of you will speak for about two minutes, and Ivana will then summarize and in, um, invite a very quick exchange of ideas. And so why don't we start with uh, Christian? And Christian um, works with Reverse the Trend NAPF, and I'll allow you to elaborate on that organization. Yes, thank you so much, Susan. Hello, everyone. So I'm Christian Shibanu, and I am the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator of the Nuclear HP Peace Foundation, and also one of the project coordinators of um, Reverse the Trend, Save Our People, Save Our Planet. And I actually have a brief um, slideshow, if that's OK. If it's really quick. Yes. Very quick. So Reverse the Trend is focused on amplifying the voices of people for frontline communities who've been affected by nuclear weapons and climate change. So we really work very closely 
with youth activists. And as mentioned, we're also the um, youth wing of Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, which is focused on nuclear disarmament and is spearheaded by Dr. Ivana Hughes. So we offer, we have a toolkit um, as well as a community forum, a journal, ongoing docu-series that focuses on both, you know, issues related to nuclear disarmament and climate activism, as well as a curriculum that addresses both issues. And we're all about engaging with youth activists and providing opportunities for young people to express themselves. And this is a series of pictures from the first meeting of state parties in Vienna. And lastly, in order to really get our message across and really engage with politicians, we provide opportunities through the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for students to really engage with key leaders. So this is a series of um, pictures from our latest trip. We went to Hiroshima, Nagasaki, just came back on Wednesday. So apologies, I'm still a bit jet lagged. Um, and the students um, were from both the US South Asia and the Pacific, specifically from Fiji, French occupied Polynesia, the Marshall Islands, as well as the Solomon Islands, in Fiji. And they were able to really engage with both the governor of Hiroshima as well as the governor of Nagasaki on issues related to nuclear disarmament, such as the TPNW, but also looking at climate issues as well. And then finally, in order for the youth to really express themselves creative, creatively, they organized a creative arts workshop in which both students from our group, as well as youth from Nagasaki, both high school and college students came together and created a series of paintings, which hopefully will be shown at the NPT PrepCom in Vienna, as well as the second meeting of state parties. And the paintings represent their views on both nuclear issues and climate. So this is just a really quick snapshot of what we do. Thank you. Great. And let's see, how about Nicholas to please speak next? Thank you very much. So I, I, rep, I represent Pax Christi, which is a faith-based uh, international movement for peace and reconciliation. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is uh, both coalition building and attempting to educate not only uh, our own membership, but the uh, leadership of the, the, the Catholic, Roman Catholic faith, as well as other Christians who are willing to work with us. Uh, most immediately in advance of the upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima, we have a letter which is being signed by all the uh, Pax Christi leadership of the seven member nations of the current G7, and also by prominent um, Catholic bishops and cardinals in those countries as well. On climate change, uh, we are in fact trying to link climate change and militarism but also racism and economic injustice. So we're, we're working towards uh, educating. We have a three-part method, which consists of prayer, study, and we're doing a lot of work trying to put information out before our membership to make them understand and act on those connections. And that's the third part is action. That's what I have to say, thanks. Wonderful, so succinct. Thank you so much. Alex, can you... Um close us out here for the speaking. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks so much for the discussion today. My name is Alex Rafalovic. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. And I know for many of you who have worked so hard in this movement, the non-proliferation name uh, can be a little bit concerning. It may not be your, your favorite international regime, um, but I assure you that we've we've chosen that name not in honor of the regime itself, but in honor of, of your movement and your efforts to uh, try and stigmatize uh, nuclear weapons and the nuclear industry uh, and to bring it as an issue of international concern. So we are a network, a global network of civil society organizations, over 2000 uh, in, in 127 countries who are campaigning for a new international agreement that focuses directly on fossil fuels. 
So our concern with the current uh, policy making on climate, whether it's at a national or an international level, is is too removed from the real threat and the real source. It's focused on the gases at the end of the line instead of on the cause, which is coal, oil, gas. Coal, coal oil, and gas are responsible for 86% of additional CO2 in the atmosphere this last decade, uh, and about the same kind of since the Industrial Revolution. So we're creating an international campaign to say we need an agreement for no new fossil fuel infrastructure, and then an agreement to phase out the existing infrastructure, and an agreement to ensure the peaceful and just transition uh, to a non-carbon um, energy system. So this campaign being driven by people everywhere, it's it's up to you how it could take place where you are. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the Indigenous Environment Network and Stand on Earth in California uh, convinced California legislators to uh, move a motion to endorse the idea of the treaty. Uh, so in the coming weeks, for anyone who's in California, um, the Senate there, I think, will be considering it. There are two countries that are currently proposing this idea, Vanuatu and Tuvalu, um, and we expect several more to, to join in, in the coming months. Um, and so it will be a chance uh, to amplify their demands and then to push um, push for this idea at the UN uh, Se uh, Secretary General Summit, which is happening in September uh, in New York. Uh, we also hope there'll be plenty of mobilizations of, of people in the streets calling for the end of the fossil fuel era. Um, so th this is our, our initiative. I'll post the links in the, in the chat um, so you can find out more. And we, we welcome um, everybody uh, to join. Just to conclude, we have also been doing a, a long-running um, series of consultations with peoples everywhere from all corners of the world, different perspectives to try and generate some principles for a new treaty, a treaty for this century that's not based on the old forms of international law. And the, the president of Timor-Leste actually um, gave a speech and has written several articles saying, you know, his country sits over apparently $100 billion worth of, of gas. Um, and he's being told that the only way that he can have development is to extract that gas. Um, but he doesn't want to. He As a low-lying island state, that's not in Timor-Leste's interest. So he wants to see a different development path. And when someone said, well, where would we get $100 billion for? He said Australia, which is Timor-Leste's kind of regional power, so to speak. Australia spends $100 billion upgrading its aeroplanes each year for its military. It can find $100 billion to support a develop model, development model for Timor-Leste. And so that's our vision. And I, I, I hope some of you will be able to join us. Thank you. That's very exciting. Thank you, Alex. Ivana, we are running. Yes. yes, I think we're running out of time to actually have a discussion, but I just really want to thank Christian and Nicholas and Alex for um, Christian for pointing out the importance of engaging young people and uh, especially engaging people from affected communities and Nicholas for uh, pointing out uh, the importance of involving faith communities and also interlinking um, these issues with militarism and other social justice issues. And Alex, thank you so much for telling us about the treaty. Um, you know, I I think this is going to be my second favorite treaty because for now, <laughs> the treaty on the prohibition of, of nuclear weapons still wins, um, but really delighted to hear from all of you. So let's just bring in our last set of um, panelists who are all actually going to be holding breakout rooms. So what we're just going to do is have each of you just describe what you're planning to cover in your breakout room, and then we'll let everybody everybody go so there's time in those breakout rooms for discussion. So um, let's just start with, uh, with Jim, uh, and then we'll go to Jackie and, and then Joe. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Ryan. I'm uh, with Veterans for Peace, which has about 100 chapters uh, around the world, international. Uh, we've been working on the issue of uh, uh, nuclear disarmament. In fact, our, uh, uh, we have a uh, nuclear prohibition uh, work group. Uh, they just came up with a report on nuclear posture. Uh, I put the link in the chat. Uh, also, Sort of a precursor to uh, Greenpeace is the Golden Rule, which tried to stop uh, uh, 
atmospheric testing, and it is currently on a, a great loop or an inner loop around uh, uh, the United States. We'll be in the uh, New England area uh, 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 June and July. So I'll put the link to uh, their, their website. You can check out when they're gonna be in, in your particular area. As both a veteran and a retired uh, research geologist, I'm more worried about climate change and I'm worried about Russia or China. And hence I put most of my effort into the climate crisis and militarism project. And that's what we'll be talking about. As Jill Stein said, uh, we need more money than just from nuclear, uh, uh, making more nuclear bombs that we need to, to, to claw back. We need the, the vast militarism system of over $800 billion a year to, uh, uh, we need to get that money back. So we're anti uh, spending on that and spending more for, for climate and also cutting our military's emissions, which is the number one institutional emitter of CO2 in the world. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. I just wanted to say maybe your elevator pitch about your organization and your workshop so we can move into them would be great. Um, well, that's what we're going to be uh, talking about is what, what I mentioned was we'll Sounds be talking, great. I'll be also no, talking it. about- You did a great job. Thank okay, you. Thanks. So for the other folks, so we can move into our workshops. Jackie? And it, yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Jackie Cabasso. I'm with Western States Legal Foundation, and I'm also the North American Coordinator of Mayors for Peace, which is what we'll be talking about today. Very briefly, Mayors for Peace, founded in 1982 and led by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is working for a world without nuclear weapons, safe and resilient cities, and a culture of peace in which peace is a priority for every individual. As of May 1st, Mayor Sir Peace has grown to 8,256 cities in 166 countries and regions, representing in total over 1 billion people with 223 U.S. members. Mayor Frank County of Des Moines, Iowa is the U.S. Vice President of Mayor Sir Peace. ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability, was founded in 1990. Its global network includes more than 2,500 local and regional governments in more than 125 countries, committed to sustainable urban development. ICLEI also provides oversight for the Compact of Mayors, a global coalition of city leaders founded in 2016 to address climate change at the local level. The Compact now includes over 11,500 cities and local governments from six continents and 142 countries, also representing more than 1 billion people. And by some coincidence, Des Moines Mayor Frank County is also the president of ICLEI. A resolution submitted by U.S. members of Mayors for Peace adopted last year by the U.S. Conference of Mayors shows how these issues can be brought together. The resolution, quote, calls on the administration and Congress to rein in military and nuclear weapons spending and to redirect funds to support safe and resilient cities and meet human needs, including by providing accessible and affordable health care for all, housing and food security, green sustainable energy and environmental protection and mitigation, and to increase investment in international diplomacy, humanitarian assistance and development, and international cooperation to address the climate crisis and the climate. So if you want to delve more deeply, please join our workshop. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And let's see if we can hear quickly from Joe. Yeah, I'll be real fast here. So I'm Joe Hodgkin. I'm an attending hospitalist physician at Mass General, an instructor at Harvard Medical School, board member of Greater Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility, and also a member of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. So I speak to medical and non-medical audiences on the public health effects of nuclear weapons, lobby for nuclear disarmament related legislation, and I'm also involved in our medical diplomacy work with Russian physicians for the prevention of nuclear war. So PSR is, uh, it works on both climate change and nuclear disarmament. We're sitting at the intersection of, uh, that is the topic of this webinar, and we recognize the internet interconnection of these issues. On the nuclear weapons side, our focus has been on back from the brink. So in our breakout group, I'm looking forward to sharing more about back from the brink, which is our pl uh, platform for a sane nuclear weapons policy, which has seen incredible and growing support across the country. Um, and it's related resolution in the US House of Representatives, which is HRES 77, which now has 18 co-sponsors. So this uh, bill would bring the U.S. into compliance with the treaty on uh, the prohibition of nuclear weapons and also requires adherence to the five back from the brink policies, which is a no forced use policy, ending sole presidential authority to launch nuclear weapons, uh, ending launch on warning, also known as hair trigger alert, canceling the $1.7 trillion uh, plans to 
replace the arsenal with new weapons and a multilateral verifiable treaty for complete nuclear disarmament. I noticed a lot of folks in the chat talking about needing a concrete strategy for working towards a world without nuclear weapons. And we think that Back from the Brink and HRS 77 are that strategy. So come join to talk about it. Great, thank you so much. Yes, I think we just go to Tim uh, for instructions on joining breakout rooms. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry to all the speakers who've had to uh, cut short your, your remarks. I think it's all been great. Um, uh, sadly, we, we, we've just got too many speakers in too little time. And, um, but thank you all. Um, we're going we're gonna, to um, compromise and go for 25 minutes with the breakout rooms instead of 30. And we're going to come back at 535. I hope that's okay for people. I really hope you can come back for a final just a very you know three minutes to to come back together and and finish this off but um i think the workshops will be great um most of you have signed up for something but if you are in the wrong breakout room or you want to change then just click the bottom right hand of your screen and we'll take you back to the main room and cole will help you get into the room that you want to be in so um there are there are a, a number of really excellent workshops um there's way too many people signed up for the continuation of the discussion that we've been having in the round table um so if you want to go into one of the more uh smaller workshops and you'll have more chance to talk and and hear and, and discuss so think about that um but they'll all be great the 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 follow-up workshop um will be about you know discussing how you're feeling about all this and how how we can um, address some of those um, personal issues. So if that's what you want, please go into that one. Otherwise, please join one of the three you just heard about or else we have workshops on the getting getting Congress on board with the Norton Bill in, 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 um, that, we, that you heard about at the beginning. We have, uh, if you're in Massachusetts, we have a great workshop about our uh, bill in the, in the State House and right now in, in Massachusetts. We have a workshop about um, uh, the the plowshares movement and di direct action, and um, I'm thinking of my uh, too quickly. People uh, over Pentagon. People over the Pentagon, of course, oh. and oh, and um, peace. pressuring the profiteers. Pressuring the profiteers. So there's there's lots to choose from. If you're not sure, please go into into the back into the main room, and you can get reassigned. Thank you so much. Go ah. So Central just one more notice that we did divide that. Uh, collaboration between climate and anti-nuclear into two because so many people signed up for that. Uh, so there'll be two sections of that as it were. The nuclear power is canceled because we didn't have the uh, facilitator and the PSR is also canceled and we'll put those people who signed up for that into Vets for Peace. And you can change your breakout after all that is said and done. All right, here we go, 25 minutes. Well, I think I opened it without meaning to. Okay, it's open. So go the and select, go the and enter your, your accept your breakout. Cole, I'm supposed to take notes at, at Kathleen Hamels, and I don't know how to get there. You should have something on your screen that says, you know, enter the breakout room. I it forget, doesn't. Not sure exactly what it says. It doesn't say anything. Mm. Oh, here we go. It was under the three dots. Okay. Unassigned? What? Yeah, unassigned means you haven't been assigned to a breakout room, so you have But to I have. One. Okay, well, it, the system doesn't know that, so you have to pick one. I have to take notes at Kathleen's. Then join so Kathleen's. I'm trying. I don't see it. Close all rooms, participants. Jesus. What does this mean? Okay, oh, so I think all the people here, let's see. It's five. Five, 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 five. Campaign of the climate crisis. Oh, God. Can I move the weapons? So, on the bottom of your Zoom, 
window, you should have a menu of options. And if you don't see something to join a breakout room there, try the three dots more, and then maybe you will see it. Okay, that's it. Join, okay. Okay, so everybody here is being invited to a breakout room. If you don't see that, look at the bottom of your screen where you have your, your icons that, that Zoom gives you, and one of them should say, join breakout room. Or if you don't see that, look for the three dots that say more, and maybe then you will see the thing that says join breakout room. Yeah, you're probably going to ask, but can you possibly list those breakout options? A lot of us cannot see anything about joining the breakout room. All of the three dots. Actually, I wouldn't mind. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think the people here are the ones that um, that that we don't have a preference recorded of what breakout you want to go to. So, can you put into your into the chat, please, which breakout you want to go into? I'll be able to tackle those more quickly than if you speak. So, Bree says, "Back from the brink." Claire Schaefer Duffy says, Mayors for Peace. Um, Mary Ryder says, Plowshares. Mary's already in there. Um, Evan says, Back from the Break. John Burroughs says, Mayors for Peace. Um,
Uh, Louise is asking for health effects. I have no breakout by that name, sorry. Joe Hodgkin, back from the break, okay. Peter Burgle strategy, I think he means the overall, he's not here. So if I don't move you pretty quick, go ahead and put your preference in the chat again, because I may be missing it among the others. I thought people could pick their own breakout, but it seems not to be the case. So sorry about that. Patrick and Margaret, back from the break. Um, Joanne, do four remains for peace. Well, Joanne is already in there. Sign me one if needed. All right, I'll th I think I'll just assign everybody else to the, one of the two strategy ones so we don't lose too much time here. At least you can talk about something, right? Maybe I'm doing wrong here, but let's get this going. I've got two people on the phone. I guess I'll assign them. I don't know what they're trying to do, but. Okay, now I really do think everybody here is being invited to a breakout room. But you do have to accept it. Let's see, Louise. You're supposed to be in climate and VFP, as I understood it. Yeah, it's Louise, it thinks it's inviting you, so you have to accept it. Gloria, I don't know what you're, you're referring to Guardian X. I have no idea what you're talking about. Sorry, with, I don't know what that means. You want Joe Hos Hodgkins. Um, Gloria, you're being invited to back from the brink, which is the one Joe Hodgkins is convening. You're shaking your head no. You don't agree. What can I say? Okay, well, I don't know what the problems are now. I, I muted everybody so you can try to find a solution with Oh, oh Paul? Yeah. Um, I thought I was supposed to be the record the uh, recorder person for the Vets for Peace, but Fran is there. Oh. So okay. I guess I maybe I'm not. I, can you ask Tim in, or is it too late? Or I can't really ask him, but I could move you to another breakout. But, but, but if, and if there are recorders for all of the rest of them, mm. see, I thought I was supposed to, I went to the, the well, maybe it put you into nonviolent. I don't think it has one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. EB says, switch me to Joe Hodgkins. Oh, I'm mm. unmuted. Can I talk to you, Cole? Yeah. 
Okay, there's somebody in that group. I don't know if he's left, but his name was Guardian X. Do you allow people with monikers to come into your webinars? I don't think that's very good. Uh, not intentionally, but it may get overlooked. <laughs> I, I won't go in a group where they're they so doing good. something disruptive or are they just. Well, you don't know who it is. And if you say anything that's like sensitive, you don't know who that is. Right. I think that's very dangerous. I ran a, a Balkan peace group here in Tucson for about 20 years and coordinated it. And that kind of thing is very unsavory at the very least. Okay. So they might be getting in to find out what you're doing. I mean, you don't want people from government agencies coming in as guardian x or something can you even see who's in his group um i I'd, gloria i hear you but it's not what i want to focus on right now i want to get people into breakouts I, i'll try to tackle the problem okay well you know when you get them all pigeonholed in breakouts you might want to see if guardian x is still hanging out in joe West. okay anybody um, else want to talk about breakouts need help getting into their breakout Julie? What's going on, Julie? So you're being invited to collaboration A. Can you see the thing to accept? Yeah, Glory Guardian X seems to have left the meeting. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> they did Happy register. To hear it. They did register with a strange email address, so I don't know who they are. But. Yeah, well, you can't always keep them out, but since you don't know who they are, just uh, not a good thing to let anything go on with discussion when you don't know who's in the room there. Is there going to be any part where we talk 
in this room or is it only in the breakout rooms? It's everyone, the breakout rooms are going to close at 535, which is just in four minutes. And then I think Tim has some final remarks. Okay. Um, so it's hardly worth it. I know so. there's going to be a follow up session in June that he's going to announce mm -hmm. with more kind of more, de more policy detail and organizing detail. Okay. Are you connected with the no, no to NATO things that are happening? Well, I've heard there's a women's no to NATO thing. I haven't heard yeah. much detail, but I, yeah. I know something is being talked about. It's happening. It, it, they're, they're going to do a protest when, uh, oh, what's going on in Vilnius? Some big meeting. Yeah. They're, they're planning that, and I'm, I'm in on that one. Yeah, I heard there was going to be some kind of call to action posted, but I haven't seen. I'm not sure it's ready. Yet. I'm already signed up. Uh -huh. It's Ula Klutzer. Do you know Ula? I do not know Ula. She's in Finland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jill, can you hear me? Yes. This is Ellen Thomas. Um, I was wondering, okay. is, is Greenpeace still doing door-to-door -door knocking? Let's okay. see. I think you want to talk with another member of our... Oh, group. that's right. You're green. Yeah. Green part. Right. right, I'm a different kind of green. But <laughs> okay, we're 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 not going to have a general discussion now. We've got Vicky Elson uh, for our final session. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I want to thank all of our wonderful speakers today. Um, we have had really a pretty amazing team of presenters and participants today. I want to thank everybody for coming. 
uh, on this beautiful day, uh, sharing it with, with the rest of us. And I especially want to also thank um, Cole Harrison for being our Unmuted. Your sound. Muted. She just disappeared. You're muted. Uh, Sorry, Vicky. I muted. I muted you by mistake. My bad. Please <laughs> unmute, Vicky. That's okay. Um, actually, I was just thanking you, Cole. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank Cole uh, especially for being our uh, webinar master today. I wanted to thank all of the participants and speakers and the 43 organizations that co-sponsored us today. Mm -hmm. um, this has really been an amazing event. And uh, there are some things coming up next. I have uh, just lost the screen that has the dates. There, there will be, um, you will be hearing from us by email. So uh, that will have the dates of, um, if you have those, Tim, I'd love it. Um, we are having a follow-up webinar, uh, which will be uh, a longer, more in-depth for us to go deeper into these things. We'll, and uh, we'll be having a, um, so you have your, your yeah, if you'll if you bear with me one second, I can show you this on the screen. Hold on just one second. Um, I'm so sorry, but I made these beautiful slides for you. Let me find them. As long as they're beautiful, we don't mind waiting. Oh, good. Yeah, they're really beautiful. Um, yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Um, okay, I'm still having trouble. So, um, Tim, maybe you can come on and tell us what the dates are. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, there will, so, but you will get all this in your email. So, if you want to order the Warheads to Windmills summary of our uh, upcoming report, um, go to nuclearban.us/w numeral two w or uh, write to uh, info at warheads to windmills.org. And that's what warheads to windmills, not with a numeral, it's a, it's TO, warheads to windmills. And if you, um, if you wanna, uh, if your organization would like to join this coalition as it's getting born, um, there will be a session um, coming up soon to uh, really initiate the whole project. And uh, also in the fall, Greater Boston PSR, Positions for Social Responsibility, will be putting on three different webinars um, about uh, climate and nuclear weapons. And um, please put the link in the chat. Okay, the recording will be available soon. You'll get it on your email. And if you want to hang out just a sec, I'll try to get those dates for you so you can mark your calendar. So one date I have, Vicki, as Tim had mentioned to me, there's a Warheads to Windmills Forum yep. on uh, June 24th. That's a Saturday. It'll be at noon Eastern. And it will it include a research agenda for decarbonization of the economy, international dimensions, building out public transit, housing, electrification, costing out a Green New Deal, 100% electricity from wind, water, and sun. Thank you. June 24th. Okay. Oh, I found my slides. If you want to see them, here they are. Um, Go for it. Thank you. Tim and himself has actually dropped off with the webinar. So he yeah, help, he's right anything. here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please, so, please okay. share the chat also. When you share the link to the video, that would be great. Okay. So sharing screen. Uh, these are slides from the workshop. 
Okay, thank you to all our presenters. <laughs> um, and they, they have all been really valuable and really amazing. Uh, again, special thanks to Cole Harrison, our Zoom master. Thanks to Tim and Wallace and the MAPA planning committee. Thank you to today's note takers and be sure to send your notes to Timon at nuclearband.us so that we can get them out to everybody. Here's the schedule of what's next. Okay, May 21st, inaugural meeting for organizations that wanna join the National Warheads to Windmills Coalition. June 24th, three hour forum in greater depth um, on this subject. May 23rd in person in Boston, Lobby Day at the Massachusetts State House for the Commission on Climate and Nuclear Weapons Bill. Uh, we don't yet have a date for lobbying Congress in support of Eleanor Holmes Norton's bill, HR 2775, um, but stay tuned for that. And again, in fall 2023, um, there will be uh, Boston PSR uh, webinars on climate and nuclear weapons. Thank you for being patient with me. And thank you all so very, very much for coming. Keep in touch. You will get email about the recording of this webinar, the notes from it, upcoming events. Here's the address to order uh, Warheads to Windmills and the address to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.